we have what we're talking about today is the living constitution approach. Living constitution meaning that every generation should reinterpret the constitution for itself. By that I mean every generation of unelected federal judges should reinterpret the constitution for themselves. But with that approach, the constitution is, as Jefferson said it would be, a ball of wax to be molded by any judge who wants to remold it to suit his own image. And we don't need a living constitution. We need an enduring constitution that stands the test of time. Thanks so much for being with us here on Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. Thank you so much for being with us here on the program. Be sure to like and subscribe if you do enjoy this channel because that ensures that more people get to see my conservative content, which is really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. And so if you want to help us fight that battle, you certainly can do so by clicking like and or subscribe, preferably both. All right, my next guest on the program is somebody who's been a constitutional attorney for a number of years. He works with the Foundation for Moral Law and somebody that we've had on the program a number of times, specifically to discuss religious liberty issues, because that is his area of expertise. So without further ado, we welcome back to the program, John Eidsmo. Thank you so much for being on the program, Colonel. Caleb, it's great to be with you again to talk about some of these issues that are of great concern to you and me and our audience as well. Oh, absolutely. And I've got to say, just looking at, at the news recently, this has been something that's been kind of quiet. You haven't seen a ton of media coverage on it. But yet again, on Friday, the Supreme Court actually struck down a provision from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. I believe the fifth one they've done specifically with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals so far, specifically on how states have been implementing restrictions on religious liberty when it comes to the coronavirus response. So could you talk to us a little bit about that and, and how this has been unfolding? Well, you are correct on that, Jacob, or I'm sorry, Caleb, you were correct. That's on all right. That. It's another good Bible name. That's fine. And, <laughs> but yes, the court has ruled on that. And one of the reasons we don't hear about it is it's not the narrative that the media wants us to know. What the media wants us to hear is that all those in authority are saying that we need to lock down, we need to close down, wear our masks, and mm -hmm. shut up. And when there is information to the contrary, or when authorities like the Supreme Court say to the contrary, then it seems like the media just kind of suppresses that, doesn't talk about it, or maybe puts it way over on page 18 or something. But you are correct that on several occasions, the Supreme Court has ruled in favor of religious liberty and against some of these COVID restrictions. Possibly the one that was most noteworthy was several months ago when the Supreme Court struck down Governor Cuomo's orders that restricted churches in the state of New York. Mm -hmm. And I particularly like what Justice Gorsuch said in that case when he said that even if the Constitution takes a holiday during an emergency, that holiday cannot become a sabbatical. In other words, right. you may be able to have some restrictions that are temporary, but you can't make those more long-term. They have to be as temporary as they possibly can be. Here in Alabama, of course, the governor has issued orders and these have included masks, they've included social distancing. For a while, these even required the churches not have more than nine people in attendance, 10 or, le or less than 10 is what it said. Mm -hmm. And even though those are no longer in effect, we still have a lawsuit going against the state of Alabama and the governor in particular on this because we believe that the past abuses were violations of free exercise of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and a number of other rights. And we're hopeful that the court will see it that way as well. And what we were really concerned about is that under Alabama law, the governor could issue an order like this, but then at the end of the 60 days of the order, could simply extend it for another 60 days and another ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. And that's not what an emergency order is supposed to be. Fortunately, besides our lawsuit, there is also a bill in the legislature, one of the sponsors being Senator Watley, who 
was one of my law students, I'm proud to say. Right. But anyway, we have a, a bill there that would restrict the governor's powers in this area. And so we'll see what comes out of that. But the most recent in California deals with home churches, that is, worshiping at home, and restrictions that California had placed into effect of re restricting the number of people that could gather in these. And the Supreme Court it was a 5-4 ruling, but the Supreme Court struck those orders down. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has been an issue in several of these cases involving state orders closing down churches has been equal protection. That is, when we're closing down churches, they're saying that you can only have a certain number of people meeting in a church, yet you can have a much larger number of people in Walmart or in the liquor store or other places like this without similar restrictions. And several of the courts have considered it very important that the state seem to be treating religion more severely than the freedom to go to the liquor store or go to Walmart and so on. Yeah, and, and I'm not somebody that thinks that it's always necessarily a sin for a Christian to, to consume alcohol. I've, I've never been of that mind. But I will say it's a pretty good indication that our country may have lost their way when we're de deeming the liquor store is essential and church is non-essential. That seems to me a pretty good sign we've gone off the rails at some point. Well, I would agree with that. And I would point out that the Constitution does not guarantee free exercise of liquor. It does not guarantee free exercise of shopping, but it does guarantee free exercise of religion. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't even a matter that religion needs to be given an equal position with these others. Actually, the U.S. Constitution and our founding fathers put religion in a favored position. Right. And uh, I know that some of the court cases, specifically ones written by Clarence Thomas, have kind of asserted that, even though he's saying, but, but we need to at least get back to where they're treating it equally and not specifically persecuting it. Um, but one thing that I wanted to ask you about that, and I think that you hit on something that is incredibly important, I do not think that Governor Ivey is a tyrant, but I do think that she has abused her power and made some unconstitutional decisions in the past year. And so I don't think that she has abused it to the point that, that she's become tyrannical. However, this is not about KIV. This is about what could happen if we set precedent and we have somebody that actually is tyrannical or actually was hostile towards religion. Because if they can ban people from going to church by just declaring it an emergency and they are able to extend that as long as they want, there is no check on that power then what could happen if we had somebody that was not Kay Ivey that got into office that really wanted to close church just because they liked closing churches? And I would agree with you there. And frankly, I voted for Governor Ivey last time, mm -hmm. and not with the greatest of enthusiasm, but I did vote for her. But I would simply say that she is not Governor Whitmer of Michigan, but she's not Governor Noam of South Dakota either. She's somewhere in between. And but I'd also raise some question as to how much in control of her own administration she is right now. And some of these orders may have been beyond what, what she wanted. There was a cartoon that I thought was pretty funny. It kind of maybe showed the situation pretty well, but it showed her giving a press conference when she's announcing her order. Mm -hmm. And she says, y'all stay home now unless you got to go someplace. Right, <laughs> which is... <laughs> I actually but, did a uh, Out on the Town, which is a segment I do uh, in my truck when I'm riding around, and that was the point that I made. Is like, well, uh, so far the Alabama rules say that you can only leave the house if you have to go buy something or you have to uh, go exercise, or as, and this is according to the letter of the law, anything that would maintain your daily routine. And I was like, well, wouldn't that just mean everything? Is is there much. the order? Well, no, that was not the earlier order. That's one of the later orders. Okay, well, I, I was probably going off the more recent. Yeah, earlier order was quite restrictive, but some of the later orders, mm -hmm. they had so many exceptions in them, and that's one of the complaints that we raised in our lawsuit as well. Is that this order was void for vagueness? In other words, if a government order or if a statute mm -hmm. doesn't give you reasonable notice of what is prohibited and what is permitted then it is considered to be a violation of due process, and we say that it is void for vagueness. And 
there were so many things in the order that said, make a reasonable effort to, to, if possible, or if practical, things like that. But I think of many of those things, a reasonable person would not be able to tell what was allowed and what wasn't. And it was being applied in situations, for example, one of our plaintiffs in this case is a lady who drives a school bus for a public school. Mm -hmm. And she is saying that when you start school in the fall in Alabama in August, the temperature in a school bus can get up to 118 degrees. Right. And that if you're the driver and you're wearing a mask and cause your glasses to fog up, which doesn't make for safe driving and mm -hmm. doesn't cause kids to vomit into their masks and things like that. And then she'd say also what she was noticing the kids were doing is as soon as they get off the bus, they take off the mask and they wad it up and put it into their germy pocket and it stays there until next morning when they put it back on again to get on the bus. This doesn't sound sanitary. It doesn't sound healthy. And so there are all kinds of concerns like this. And I like the way you put it here that in your show, disagreement is not hate. And right. it seems like there it seems like there hasn't been enough real disagreement on this. Let me suggest something to your audience here, if I may. Go ahead. And I suggest this not necessarily saying you need to agree with everything that this person is saying, but there's a man by the name of Christian Elliott who has posted something titled 18 Reasons I Won't Be Getting a COVID Vaccine. And if you just simply Google it, 18 Reasons I Won't Be Getting a COVID Vaccine, you'll find it right away. But okay. it is very, the information is very good. It is very well stated. Some of the things he points out and repeatedly here, he's saying, look, if I'm wrong on this, tell me so. I'd, I'd like to open discussion on this, but mm -hmm. pointing out that the law exempts these vaccine companies from liability in case there's something wrong here that points out that these vaccine companies like AstraZeneca and Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, that they have never before brought a vaccine to market, that they have had quite a bit of misconduct where they've been sued or prosecuted in the past. He points out that one of the things that we're concerned about here on this is that supposedly we these do not prevent the spread of COVID. So if you had a mask, you still need, or if you had the shot, you still need a mask and so on because you still could be a spreader. Well, one of our concerns has been the asystematic or asymptomatic spread. Mm -hmm. In other words, even if you don't have any symptoms, you still could be spreading it. So is giving the vaccine then increasing the possibility of asystematic, a, I'm sorry, I keep saying that wrong, asymptomatic right. spread. And another point he makes here, point 16, he says is the censorship and the complete absence of scientific debate. He says, let me just read you a portion here. He says, I can't help but get snarky here, so humor me. How did you enjoy all those nationally and globally televised, robust debates put on by public health officials and broadcast simultaneously on every major news station? Wasn't it great hearing from the best minds in medicine, virology, epidemiology, economics, and vaccinology, from all over the world as they vigorously and respectfully debated things like lockdowns, mask wearing, social distancing, vaccine efficacy and safety trials, how to screen for susceptibility to vaccine in injury, therapeutics. Wasn't it great seeing public health officials have their science questioned? Wasn't it great seeing the FDA panel publicly drill the vaccine makers in prime time as they stood in the hot seat? on tough questions about products of which they have no liability. Oh, wait, you didn't see those debates? No, you didn't, because they never happened. What happened instead was heavy-handed censorship of all but one narrative. And I think that's why so many people have become skeptical today. They keep hearing us being warned, you must believe science. Okay, then do I believe this scientist or that scientist? And if I believe this scientist, then do I believe what he said last week, this week, or next week? 
they change their opinions so often when we understand that, that this is all an uncertainty here and we're all dealing freshly with some things. But each time they change it, they pronounce their new opinion with such dogmatism and anybody who questions them is anti-science and pro-virus and everything else. And I think it is that dogmatism and authoritarianism that is causing many of us to be skeptical. Well, and I think that you understand this as well as somebody that is a, a fan of and an advocate for the First Amendment, just like I am. It never bodes well when one side of the argument wants to shut the other one up. If you have one side saying, yeah, let's let's talk about this, let's ask some questions, and the other side is saying, no, if you even differ in opinion, you are dangerous and your opinion should not get any oxygen. Generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, that's a pretty good indication that the side trying to shut the other one up doesn't have a good argument. Very, very well said. And it brings to mind right now what's going on in Alberta, Canada, with mm -hmm. a couple of churches out there. And just after the Easter weekend, we were informed of the news about a church out there in Alberta, pastored by a Polish immigrant, a pastor who had grown up under communism in Poland and came to Canada thinking he would find freedom here and being very disturbed that recently there seemed to be some restrictions on the church here, similar to what he chafed under, under communism in Poland. And he had several police officials it was either a Good Friday or, a, or an Easter service. Several police officials come in to his church to interrupt his service and tell them that they had to shut down. And he refused to let them shut them down. He ordered them out. And as they stood there for a while, one member of the congregation simply turned over to the office and said, if you don't have a warrant, you need to leave. And they did. And then another church, Grace Life Church, it is called, where mm -hmm. the state has closed down or the province has closed down the church and even put a fence around it to keep people from attending it but last sunday there were some 500 people gathered outside there to oppose those regulations and show support and the people that gathered outside well they're being we're being told here by the news media that these people were conspiracy theorists far right and other things like this and members of hate groups and so on well that's a term that's starting to irritate me hate groups what they mean by hate groups is groups we hate and but that's a good way to put it unfortunately uh, but yeah i agree the hate seems to be coming from the other side and anyway one official is saying that these people are buying into all these conspiracy theories and there is so much wrong information being spread about COVID-19 and so on. Okay, if it's wrong information, refute it. Mm -hmm. Tell us why it's wrong. Don't just brand it as wrong and expect us to believe you. Right, and one thing that I, that was actually where I was going to go with this conversation anyway, with the incidents that we've seen in Canada. Of course, Canada has no right to freedom of religion. They do not have a First Amendment. But I think it was very shocking for a lot of people to see this, not in Iran or North Korea or China, but to see something like this actually unfold in North America, our neighbors to the north, in a, a, a nation that we generally consider to be America light or something you know akin to us. And so I, my follow-up question in that would ultimately just be, uh, do you think that this could happen in America? Does the First Amendment guarantee that this would be beyond the pale that it could never happen or is this something that uh, even with our first amendment maybe down the road we could see something similar to this happening i'd say it's a distinct possibility and you're right we have looked at canada as probably our best ally and a 2000 mile unguarded border that we've had that we've been able to share with canada mm -hmm. we see them as coming out of the same english legal tradition and having many of the same rights as ours, not the exact same constitution to protect them, but a legal tradition that protects those rights. But many of those things already are going on in the United States. Canada seems to be a little bit further down the line on these things than we are. Right. Luckily, but, so far, we haven't hmm. thrown a, a preacher into prison or put fences around churches. Not yet, but I mean, that, that's what I'm asking. Like, 
Could we see that happen in the near future? We've done some things that are close, but mm. to say we're not quite as far down as Canada is on this, but we're moving in the same direction, or we have been. And one of the really, really encouraging things, I think, if you look to things that President Trump did while he was in office, is appointing three new justices to the Supreme Court in Gorsuch and Kavanaugh and now Barrett, and all three of them seem to be standing very firm for religious liberty, and I'm thankful for that. And, But nevertheless, we have what we're talking about today is the living constitution approach. Living constitution meaning that every generation should reinterpret the constitution for itself. By that, I mean every generation of unelected federal judges should reinterpret the constitution for themselves. But with that approach, the constitution is, as Jefferson said it would be, a ball of wax to be molded by any judge who wants to remold it to suit his own image. And we don't need a living constitution. We need an enduring constitution that stands the test of time. Fortunately, we have a number of justices on the Supreme Court, I hope a majority, that are taking that position right now. But how long they will continue, God only knows. And we can only pray, God save this honorable court. Well, I've said for a long time that people that are sort of adopt that doctrine that you're talking about, the living constitution, they only want it to be living so that they can kill it. Because if it's not living, if it's eternal, then they can't do anything to it. But if it's living, they can kill it. And so, ultimately, I think that that is the goal. However, I will say, and and talking about something that you just touched on uh, there in in the last thing that you were talking about, um, when it comes to the Supreme Court and the makeup of the court, I do agree with your assessment that Justice Barrett and Justice Kavanaugh, and, and frankly, you probably shared some of my concerns about Justice Kavanaugh, but so far, he's been pretty good. And is that something that is going to at least act as a, I know that that's going to be something that acts as kind of a backdrop to this, but I guess my question is, what do we do in the meantime? Because as great as it is to have a Supreme Court that strikes these things down, you know, these restrictions, even the cases that make it to the Supreme Court in a relatively timely manner, it could be one to two years before this stuff really gets overturned and the Supreme Court makes a ruling on it. And so um, I think it's really more important to have a culture of liberty and a culture of freedom to where these things wouldn't happen in the first place. And, and how do we get to that point? All the Supreme Court can do is buy time. That is, they can slow down the process by which we ignore the Constitution. If we have a public and if we had an executive branch and a legislative branch that are determined to ignore the Constitution. All the court can do is just buy time and slow down the process. But you're correct on that, that I mean, it takes some time. And one thing that I'll say I am optimistic about with our new justices of the court, we have three that were appointed by President Trump. And yet when several cases came before them, like the Texas versus Pennsylvania case challenging election results, they didn't do what Trump wanted them to do. And honestly, in that particular instance, I was very disappointed that they didn't. If they had, you know, generally, I don't want an activist court, but if right. they had acted as they should have before the election, some of this could have been presented, pre prevented. But let me just say this. If these justices are willing to stand up to President Trump and his administration, I'm hopeful they'll be willing to stand up to Biden and his administration as well. I, I totally agree with you, but at the same time, that's like the ultimate glass half full moment. I, I concur with your opinion. I'm just saying that like I, I wouldn't have even thought to think of it that way, but I appreciate that you brought that to the table. Because I do think it says something to their strength of character, and, and I think mm -hmm. that even though Justice Barrett hasn't been on the court very long, even she has shown some real backbone in, in this, and I think it's unfortunate that the justice that has shown little backbone, if any, has been Justice Roberts, who in the past several cases, including the one that, that came down uh, Friday when it came to the church's gathering in California, Justice Roberts again sided with the, the liberal side of the court, and I'm wondering if we should just start counting him, not even as a Justice Kennedy, but as maybe a another Justice Breyer. 
Well, I would still hope that he is better than Justice Kennedy. And these are decisions where he's ruled on technical matters. For example, in the, several of these religious liberty cases, cases involving COVID, where mm -hmm. he has been on the other side, he has simply been un unwilling to issue an emergency order and has limited it to that. He hasn't joined with the dissenting opinions of Justice Kagan and Sotomayor and the liberal branch of the court. He has concurred with them for different reasons. Mm -hmm. On the abortion issue, for example, we saw in June Medical that he felt we were bound by the previous precedent in that case because even the plaintiffs in that case had not challenged that precedent. And But when the ultimate case comes before the court to overrule Roe versus Wade, and it might be our Alabama statute that brings it before them, but when that case comes before them, I am still hopeful that Justice Roberts will find himself on our side. Well, I certainly hope that that is the case because a 6-3 so opinion said, sounds a lot better. You notice I said hopeful. I didn't say confident. Yeah, I know. I, know. I, I caught that too. Um, but going forward, you do think that by and large with the, the three new justices, at least until the makeup of the tort changes again, we, we probably are on pretty safe grounds concerning that. I think I'll just stick with my original statement again. Hopeful. Not confident, but hopeful, optimistic. Fair enough. So before we go, I did want to ask about the Alabama case and get a, a few more details on that. How is that going and what's the status of that right now? Well, it is before the court right now. And the state is now saying that our lawsuit is moot simply because the orders that we are challenging are no longer in effect. Right. We are arguing that it is not moot, number one, because the abuse here is capable of repetition. In other words, they could reinstitute those orders at any time, especially with all this talk about variant forms of the virus coming in, that mm -hmm. mutant forms, that, that this could be reinstated at any time. But secondly, we sue not only for an injunction against future orders, but we're also suing for nominal damages because of the past orders. We've had businesses that have been very badly damaged because mm -hmm. of this. Contracts, for example, one one of our clients, a chiropractic firm, has regular memberships in their clinic that they give, and these had to be canceled because, in effect, the clinic had to be virtually closed down and so mm -hmm. on. And, and so we are suing for past violations, and so we believe that we will survive their argument that this is moot. But that's what's being argued right now. Well, I certainly uh, wish y'all Godspeed, and, and I do hope that that takes place because I, I still assert and have since the very beginning that Kay Ivey's orders were against the Alabama Constitution because even the provision that she cited in Alabama law that stated that she had, quote-unquote, permission to do this, I read it, and it was based on basically basically health inspectors being able to inspect schools and restaurants to make sure that they're not serving rancid food or something. And somehow she got out of that that this means I can shut down every business in the state for an indefinite amount of time. I don't see how any sane person could read that statute and get that out of it. But nonetheless, I've I've maintained that from the very beginning, and you're right. The main thing is I'm not as worried about Governor Ivy, even though I think she made some very uh, well-intended but, but dumb decisions when all of this first started. I'm more worried about what happens if we have a governor that is a little bit more gung-ho about being able to shut all of this down. If we did have somebody similar to a Whitmire or a Cuomo or a Newsom, if we had that, I'm, I'm more worried about what would happen if that scenario were to take place. And that's why I think your argument is absolutely correct that this is not a moot because this is something that could be replicated if given an emergency. And if we've learned anything from this coronavirus situation, it's that once government takes power under the guise of an emergency, they want to just declare that it's an emergency all the time. And you made a very valiant or very valid point here too, Caleb. And that's that when you give a power to somebody in government, don't give it to a particular official just because we're 
confident that that official will use it wisely. Mm -hmm. We always, when we give power to government officials, we have to remember that they're going to be replaced. And the question to ask is, would I want someone of the opposite political party, the opposite philosophy, or of the worst possible character to be able to exercise this power? And if the answer to that is no, then we shouldn't give that power to even the best person. Oh, absolutely. Uh, before we go, though, and I always try to give an opportunity for any of my guests to do this. If there were like, because, you know, I'm not a genius. And every time that I have somebody on, I, I can't possibly think of everything they might need to let us know. So is there anything that I've neglected to ask that maybe you would like our audience to know if you could just uh, is there anything, any piece of information that they need that I haven't thought to ask about or cover? Well, we sometimes say war is too important to be left to the generals and that education is too important to be left just to teachers. So let me add, too, that the Constitution is too important to be left to just to lawyers. And I assume the majority of our listeners here are not lawyers. But I would encourage you, read the Constitution. Get it, read it for yourself. See what it says. Notice the limits that it places on government power and consider those limits the next time you decide who to vote for in an election. I, you know, I couldn't agree more, Colonel, and every Christian should have read the Bible cover to cover. Every American should have read the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence multiple times as well. I, I think that that just comes with it. You should have to, to be able to do that. And, you know, there was a time it was impossible to get through the school system without having done that, but that is no longer the case. But thank you so much for being with us. We certainly appreciate it. And uh, thank you for being generous with your time. Excellent interview, Caleb. Let's do it again. All right. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call the TV guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>